Well, let's get started. How are you? Welcome. My name is Rusty Humphreys, and this is the Rusty Humphreys Rebellion. And do me a favor, if you would, please. Check in. Let me know who you are and where you are a deplorable from. Now's a good time to get started. There's a lot going on. And I'll tell you, well, uh, one of the things is, uh, it appears, the runoff in Georgia is over. Uh, Brian Kemp defeats Casey Cagle in Georgia's GOP gubernatorial runoff. Uh, I used to be all over Georgia politics. Uh, I'm not anymore, but I've heard good things about both the guys. So, But I've heard a lot of good things about Brian Kemp, so congratulations, Brian Kemp, and hopefully we can keep... Georgia in the red. Georgia. Devil went down to Georgia. I asked Charlie Daniels one time, why, why did the devil go down to Georgia? Couldn't the devil have gone to Florida? Maybe the devil went down to Arizona. Devil went down to Texas. And he said, son, there's just something about the way you say Georgia. Devil went down to Georgia. He was looking for a soul to steal. I can't do it. I, I'm, I'm silly even even trying. A Tucson adorable. <laughs> Elizabeth, adorable. I like that. That's funny. Nona is from Olympia, Washington State. Of course I know where Olympia, Washington is. I grew up in Des Moines, Washington. Paul's checking in. Charles is there. Mary is there. Linda, hi. Sandra, hello. Uh, Linda, another Linda is in Missouri. Kara is there. Dottie's giving us the thumbs up. Paul is in Osaniki, Michigan. I, 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 I don't know what that is. Pedro, hello. Good evening. Terry's there. Bill is in Florida. Todd checking in. Linda's in Missouri. Michael checking in. Scott is in Minnesota. Pat says, hey, y'all. Hey, y'all. St. John's, Arizona is where John is. Edward is saying howdy from Crown Point, New York. Kara says, hey, bud. Stephen, hello. Vernon's in Las Vegas. Sharon's there. Janet says, hey, y'all. Howard's in Maryland. Elizabeth there. Uh, George, Paul, Shane. Um, Sandy says, Sandy's there. It's a big one. I'll read that in a little bit. Sorry. Angela's in Washington, Illinois. Janet's in Redland, Florida. Martin checking in from the UK. Elizabeth is a Washington native. Larry is from New Hampshire, Hampton, New Hampshire. <laughs> James says the devil went to Chicago. Yeah. And Kara's reminding everybody to share, 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 share the page. And I would sure appreciate it. Okay. So the latest thing in liberal land is now we're going to ban straws. Um, straws get into the ocean. Straws are horrible. Straws are the scourge of, of the earth. We're going to get into that in a second. But what has happened is, is that our country, we no longer worry about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You're not, unless you're living in a place like Chicago, you're not walking down the street worried about getting shot. Uh, only liberals think that Trump is going to round you up and put you in a concentration camp. That's not happening. So all we have left really is pursuit of happiness. And the problem is, is that the left is trying to invent things to be unhappy about. Because for them, being unhappy feels good. It's not about the pursuit of happiness for yourself. It's about feel-good measures that don't really accomplish much. Uh, one of the other things that's uh, happening right now is now tipping is uh, racist. Uh, there's a, uh, a group that has uh, these videos where everything is racist. Everything in the world is racist. And by the way, the worst thing you can be in today's society is racist. So let's take a look and see why tipping is so horrible. If you eat at a restaurant in the U.S., you're expected to tip. It's just the right thing to do. 
But what if I told you that tipping has a racist past? And it's not just because black waiters get smaller tips than their white co-workers, or that the tipped minimum wage just makes the poor poorer. It's that the custom of tipping in America was racist from the very beginning. And it really? goes all the way back to slavery. Tipping started among European aristocrats in the 17th century. Rich Americans adopted the practice in the mid-1800s and it spread throughout the country after the Civil War. Here's why. According to research by activist Saru J. Rahman, newly freed slaves were flocking to major cities to find work. But they were only hired for jobs that were considered unskilled, mostly in restaurants. Racist restaurant owners embraced tipping as a way to hire free slaves without actually having to pay them any wages. And customers were down with this new practice because they believed it was natural to tip their inferiors. Racism and classism run deep. This attitude is summed up in this passage by a reporter in 1902. I had never known any but Negro servants. Negroes take tips, of course. One expects that of them. It is a token of their inferiority. But to give money to a white man was embarrassing to me. By the late 1880s, black workers accounted for nearly half of the hospitality industry. Then in the 20s, restaurants that were losing money because of prohibition laws encouraged tipping, making it even more popular. Over time, tipping became the norm. And thanks to the powerful lobbying of the restaurant industry, in 1938, Congress passed America's first minimum wage law, allowing states to set a lower wage for tipped workers. In 1986, the then head of the National Restaurant Association, Herman Cain, convinced oh, Herman the Republican-led Congress to set a two-tiered wage system for tipped and non-tipped workers. The tipped minimum wage was set at $2.13 per hour. Today, in 17 states, the legal minimum wage for tipped workers still only $2.13 per hour. A century later, the inherent racism of tipping persists. Non-white restaurant workers take home 56% less than their white peers. And now, there's a new demographic that's suffering. Women. According to J.R. Rahman, almost 66% of the 6 million the tipped activists. workers in America are women. Europe, where this whole thing began, has long moved past tipping to pay restaurant workers a full wage. So maybe it's time for America to change its tipping culture too. Okay. Uh, I'm convinced. I'm not going to tip anymore. You got me. Congratulations. Uh, your argument was strong, and I'm never going to tip again. Thank you. Wow, that was great. Um, and it's racist, too. See, here's what my point is. Is that when you really don't have anything to complain about, um, everything seems horrible. Right? Isn't that what's going on here? Everything to them seems horrible because really things aren't that bad. You want to see something that's bad? You want you want to see the difference? We're talking about she's talking about the poor and racism and how horrible it is and how America's so awful. It was about a year ago that I went to Cambodia. And what you're seeing, if you're listening on a podcast, let me try to explain it to you. Uh, and I'm going to play a, a little clip of video that I took outside a window. And then I walked down there, but I'm not going to play enough of it. Um, there are multiple long, I wouldn't call them anything other than shacks. And right out in front is a field with no grass. It's just plain dirt. And it's filled with not just garbage, but cows and goats walking through these mounds of garbage, looking and scrounging for food. And I remember, and, and the, the people that were taking me here were so proud of this. Because these people had no homes a couple of years ago. So they built these homes. And uh, it was a, it's a Christian charity group that built these homes. And, they, and they were, they're were they good people. And they're so proud of these homes. And I'm looking at it and going, oh, my God, this is the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. What, you know, have they not heard of a garbage can before? Where, have they not, you know, 
heard about a a shovel. By the way, Mary Beth is saying, talk about illegals, talk about immigration, talk about socialism. Well, I'm talking about socialism now. Illegals and immigration, is that not what every single show talks about every single day and nothing new is coming ever? Would you like to learn something new and something different? Okay. So we're getting to the socialism here in a second. It's not that these homes are run as a socialist society, although they get help from the Christian organizations. It's just that when you're super poor, things like trash don't mean anything. Go to the Middle East. One of the, the one of the saddest things I've ever seen is you go to Jerusalem and in front of the some of the holiest sites in all of Christendom, they are in the backyard of people that live there. Here's what happens in a lot of these places. The homes are clean. They take the garbage and throw it out the back window, never to be picked up again. And so when the liberals are talking about, oh, we got to worry about racism on everything and, and, the, and the poor, um, our poverty knows nothing. Poor people in America have no idea about real poverty. Let me show you real poverty in Cambodia that I saw here on the Rusty Humphreys Rebellion. Take a look at this. I'm just, a matter of fact, I'm shooting this from a, a hospital room. I had some down below shots too, but I just, I just found this today. And these are, these are about two years old, as I understand, maybe five. And this is man living large. And look, look at the, the garbage and the filth and the poverty and the, the goats and the, you know, the cows that are living there uh, looking for food. And we're going, and this woman's going, yeah, tipping is racist. Uh, these folks in Cambodia, I promise you, would love a good tip. But we're going to sit around and and pretend that we have super poverty in America. They have no, we, our country has no idea. No idea what real uh, poverty is. And to come out and say, you know, tipping is racist. Yeah, yeah uh, uh, people of color get less tips than the white folk. I, I, I don't know what you want me to say or do. Do I think that all of the rules are fair and that, I mean, for example, uh, my daughter got a, my daughter's worked at Taco Bell and she was trying to up her game. So she went to a restaurant up the street that was serving Hawaiian food. And they wanted to pay her $3 an hour and minimum wage is 10 now here in Arizona, which I think is a little, is quite high. You can't feed a family of four on $10 an hour. You're not supposed to. You're not supposed to feed a family on minimum wage. We're not supposed, that's, that's the wage for kids like my daughter just getting into the workforce. This is the problem when you have uncontrolled illegal immigration coming into your country. <sighs> anyway, and and let's see. Uh, CB says waiters and wait some waiters and waitresses make lots of money in tips. It depends on where they work, the businesses, the geographical locations. Some bartenders make hundreds in tips in just one month. I'll bet you they make more than that. You know, but this restaurant that my daughter wanted to work at, uh, they only wanted to pay, well, I think, $3 an hour because, oh, tips were involved. No, it's a fast food restaurant for Hawaiian food. It's one step above McDonald's. People don't tip there. Well, we have a tip jar out. Okay, that's baloney. Okay, that's crap. But go down to the local steakhouse where you're paying $100 a piece or $70 a piece. You know, those tips make big money. 
And you have to be a good waiter to make those kind of tips. And you should. Marzita says, thank you. It's a good thing to show how the other half lives. Yeah. Reese says, color is never a consideration when I tip. Me either. It doesn't even cross my mind. I do 20% just about everywhere unless the person's terrible. And if the person's great, I'll do 25. I don't know if that's good enough for you or not, but that's, that's what I do. Rolly says, wow, I had to search for you tonight. Huh, I wonder why. Rolly's sharing. Thank you. Tim says, I know bartenders that make like 150 a night in tips. Yeah. So this whole thing, um, Shane said, goats, it must be Muslims nearby. No, th- these, these were Christians. Uh, well, Cambodia does have a large Muslim population. They have a small Christian population. It's mostly... It's a form of Buddhism, as I recall. They have these really amazing temples everywhere. Um, Cambodia is a fascinating country. Um, Paul says, I agree with you. I did two tours from the Middle East that looks worse than in any army camp that I saw. I mean, that's the truth. And and that's the other thing. I saw um, uh, Fox Business, John Stossel, say on, the, on this whole thing with straws, that most of the straws in the garbage come from Africa and Middle Eastern countries. And that's where the garbage, and that's true. It's just true. Did we have a need for environmentalism in the 70s? Yes. But the air, I was in Los Angeles over the weekend. Uh, the air is considerably cleaner. The water is cleaner. The food supply is better. Back off. Get over here. Now we got to do straws. When when does it stop? Wesley says, I saw a little girl fall into an open sewage gutter and nobody did anything about it. She, why she stood there crying. Oh, that's awful. Minimum wage in the UK is seven and a half pounds. And this is now the normal for everyone. Most women that work for tips, says Shelby, needed the tip to raise their children after they were left to raise fatherless children who were left widowed or with whatever. When they raised minimum wage, people stopped tipping so they couldn't afford to support their children with the wage. Diane says here in Michigan, the tips are taxed. Tim says tips are taxed everywhere on a federal level unless you give cash. Diana says, I'm a woman who's gone to eat alone once they know how... I am too, then I get noticed. Uh, Sammy says, why can't the libtards have common sense? Good question. Rolly says, remember paper straws. I hated those things. Shane says, the straw argument's easy. Solve, go back to paper straws. I don't like the paper straws. I don't like the paper straws. Um, Newt Gingrich did a little show today with uh, um, leader McCarthy. The little Facebook Live. I'm not going to play a bunch of it, but let's just uh, cut in a little bit, just see what they have to say. I always like to hear what uh, Speaker Gingrich has to say. He's always great. Let's just take a little eavesdroppy listen here on the Rusty Humphreys Rebellion. We want everybody to be able to see government while we're working, and they're working too, walking all through. Well, and I want to congratulate you because uh, with your leadership as the majority leader, yep, yep, just yep, to yep, take yep. the issue yep, of yep, opioids, yep. the number. Yep, 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 yep. Okay, let's fast forward, sorry. Fast forward. Example of innovation, the National Institutes of Health are working on non-addictive painkillers. So we can literally replace all of the opioids by having a painkiller that's effective, but that doesn't make you addicted. That's what we need. You know, you go from an aspirin to an opioid. We need something in between. That's right. Which is so key. And that's really, one last thing before we get into all the questions. You know, we just had a, a debate on agree. the floor here. I do agree with that about opiates. That they've, abolish they've gone ice. crazy. Do you know <laughs> the tons of drugs that they are able yeah. to eliminate? And a lot of that is fentanyl. And a lot of the gangs they stop is MS-13 that are bringing that into our community. But who would have thought that people would vote, want to abolish ICE or vote present? And 133 Democrats voted present that day. Yeah, you know, there's something wrong with the whole mindset 
that thinks that the world is benign and that if you had no borders, everything would work perfectly. Fact is, there are millions of people who would come here if there were no borders. Uh, the drug cartels would love it if there were no borders. And uh, we would be a much more dangerous country. I, I don't think the people who get involved in this kind of talk have visited enough places that don't work. Exactly. You know, you, you go to a Venezuela, you go to uh, Syria, you go to a variety of places where you realize how much more difficult and dangerous life is. And then you look at the U.S. and frankly, the fact that we are a country, that we do have laws, that we have brave people like the officers in ICE who are willing to risk their lives to protect this country, uh, it makes all the difference in the world. You know, six of those officers gave the ultimate price, lost their life over protecting us in America. And that's what's key as we go through. But I want to talk a little bit about something you've always focused on. Um, the idea of technology, making, having technology make government closer to the people, having the data to give it greater efficiency, effectiveness, and accountability, and kind of get your view on that in ways that we can transform government to make it more accountable by using technology. Well, one, one of the things I was proudest of when I first became speaker uh, was that we were able, the day after I was sworn in, we were able to put online what was then called the Thomas System, which is now the That's right. House Information System. Bill Thomas always thought it was named for him. <laughs> <He did. laughs> it was actually named for Thomas Jefferson, but that was not. But one of the great moments, and you'll appreciate this having led uh, the conference, was when we introduced the tax cuts in 95. Congressman Bill Archer, who had been there a long time, would never have dreamed he'd be doing this, got up and actually read into the record how you could locate this brand new tax bill online <laughs> so you could download it yourself at home. And I thought, that was a real revolution. And of course, you've done more of that. And I think the more, one of the answers to all the talk about the deep state and all the talk about corruption is honesty and transparency and accountability. And then people can make their own mind up. Uh, and, and that's why I've advocated, for example, that the president should uh, go through and, and uh, declassify certain documents so people can see the whole document. I mean, a lot of this yeah, stuff. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Okay, uh, you could find that on Newt Gingrich's Facebook page. Uh, he's always uh, got good stuff, but I don't want to sit here all day and listen to Newt yap. Uh, let's see here. Dave says, I tip. I don't give a blank what anybody thinks. Well, according to the left, now you're a racist for tipping. Okay. Okay. Carolyn checking in from Ashland, uh, hello from Ohio. Wesley says the Social Security Act of 1932 was never under discussion for repeal. Why? Because you would lose every single person over the age of 62. Every single person would vote against you. You can't do it. Can't do it. Shirley checking in from Spokane Valley, Washington. Hey, Shirley, how you doing? Ron says opioids are a business just like cancer. By the time they change it, people who made the big money will be long gone. Yeah. You know, I've had family members uh, pass away unexpectedly from that. Opioids. Prescription opioids. And it's, uh, it's awful. It's awful. Let's see here. Minimum wage is just that, says Lexton. Minimum wage. I consider it like Social Security. It's to help, but it's not meant for a family. Tips are great, but nothing's guaranteed unless it's a strip bar. I'm not even joking. I brought my ex brought in 300 plus on a slow night. People roll the dice. If you depend solely on tips, I also agree with your poverty statement. Some of my relatives still live on reservations because I'm Indian, but even they have control of their own destiny. You know, when I was a stripper, I'll just, <laughs> I didn't make a dollar a night. No, I never did it. Although when you got a body like this, people just want to see it. Uh, President Trump uh, spoke to veterans groups after the Senate confirmed a new VA secretary. Uh, he brought a World War II vet up and the guy who's in his 90s, but still speaking pretty good. I thought you might want to take a look at this. Uh, what he had to say here on the Rusty Humphreys Rebellion. I just thank you. This is one of the highlights of this 94-year-old man. 
I just want to tell you a few things, may I, yes. Mr. President? <laughs> I've got time. <laughs> I had four brothers serve in World War II. My oldest brother was lost off the coast of Italy many times. I just wish that he could, could come back to the land of free and the home of brave again. Give, give this man some thumbs ups, please. Please, some thumbs ups and some hearts. Share this video, please. I've given to the veterans of foreign wars 70 years of my life. Thank you. My wife's with me today, but she's, she's not here, she's not feeling well. And my children are watching me today, hopefully, to know <laughs> that their dad got to stand beside the President of the United States. <laughs> With the President. Mr. President, I want to ask you something. I've been told that I could never enter the Oval Office in Washington, D.C. I'm going to be 95 years of age, April 11th of next year. Hopefully, that you will allow me to bring my family into the Oval yes. Office to meet you. Oh, that's awesome. One last thing, Mr. President. Tell me about Stormy Daniels. I want to tell you, Mr. President, this group knows not to give the mic to Alan Q. Jones when he's at a state convention or the national convention. I asked you to autograph this picture personally because this is, was taken to you with you when you were running for election right. as, as the President of the oh, United States. Thank you. Beautiful. Wow. Thank you. Let me have that. <laughs> have a good one here, Alan. That's so beautiful. You know what I like about this is that people treat him like a human being, yeah, but yeah. with respect. Obama was just your buddy. Let's go smoke dope together. Let's go have yeah, a beer yeah, summit. Yeah. This was respect. You got it. Thank you, Alan. And class. God bless you, Mr. President. And I wish you well in the future. Thank you, Jim. Right. Oh, man, that's great. And, you know, more and more uh, we're seeing veterans just loving, just love the president. And, and that's a good thing. You know, we went through eight years of a president that abused the military, sent them all over the place, didn't really respect them, paid a lot of lip service. Janiel's checking in from Bellingham, Washington, which is where I went to college, about 20 miles south of the Canadian border. Peggy says, that's heartwarming. Janiel says, oh, that's sweet, both of them. Dan says, done. He will see it through. Very classy, says Wesley. Kara says, another reason that the left hates him is because our veterans and military love him because he loves and respects them. Yeah. 
Lexington says, uh, Lexton says, amen to both of them. Great men both, says Dan. Roy Rogers Sr., amen. Carolyn tries to serve their vets there in Ashland. Carol lost her WW2 grandfather in 2000. Miss him every day. Curtis says, best president ever. Christy says, I'm so proud of both of those men. Lexton says, are you joking? Obama wouldn't even give a vet an opportunity to be on stage. Susan, thumbs up. You know, I'm not sure that the mainstream media even would play that video. Maybe. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure. You know, it's to me, it's so shocking on just how far the left continues to go. And... That's the good news. The good news is, is that the, okay, I don't know about you, but the people in my circles who were Tea Party people don't seem to be as engaged as they were before Obamacare during the Tea Party movement. It's almost like, God, we're so sick of it. We're just so sick of it. We've seen it now over and over and over and we're done. We're just sick of it. The left has some oomph behind them because it's being driven by hate. The good news, though, is that the hate is going so far to the left that regular people who aren't paying attention or were former Tea Party people that dropped out or whatever are going, enough, I'm done. Segment on Tucker Carlson the other day. Uh, now what the left wants to call babies. You see this one? Check this out. This is amazing. Baby, how would you be able to change your child's diaper? Because the second you change the diaper, of course, you'd no longer be able to pretend that there was a question about whether this was a boy or a girl. You would know. <laughs> well, it's not about pretending. The parent definitely knows the gender. It's about not necessarily labeling the baby. It's about allowing the baby to decide what gender that baby wants to be when that baby can decide, which is around four years old. For, so from zero to four, the baby will not be labeled. The labeling theory will not apply from zero to four years old. The baby will be a baby, neither a boy nor a girl. Uh, whatever gender Nuts. that baby so what other chooses per, what to other, be. What other profound life decisions do we think people ought to be making at the age of four? Are there any others? Yeah, you wouldn't even let them choose well, a dinner. Whether to get a tattoo, whether to get married, enlisting in the military, voting, drinking vodka, smoking Marlboro Reds. Is there anything else that we think four-year-olds are ready to decide? Uh, this isn't actually a profound... Okay, I want before, before I let her continue, I want you to start voting. Thumbs up. You know what? I think a baby at the age of four should be able to decide what sex they want to be. That's not God's choice. That's not the choice of their loins. That's the choice of their feelings. Thumbs up if you agree with that. Or what are you, freaking nuts? The Lord said what sex you want to be. Get over it. Uh, Give me some frowny faces if that's where you go. I'm I'm just curious as this goes on. Thumbs up if you agree with her or frowny face if you do not. Life decision. I mean, biologically, there's nothing really going on from zero to four in that area that affects a person's life. Um, Biologically, the experts say that boys and girls, uh, all genders are alike the the boy's brain the male brain might be a little larger the uh females language might be a little bit more advanced okay. no maybe, sexism but... on my show hold on whoa sorry, slow down no sorry. here you're out there like they say maybe boys brains are, are larger and yeah. i just want to say that kind of toxic masculinity has no place in this program <laughs> sorry thank you very much but that's all but no look the, the bottom yeah. line is yeah. Yeah, all they could think of, like, difference in brain size, difference in genitalia, Perhaps. difference in bone structure. Perhaps. Just minor things. Minor. Like, just minor, minor, minor things like that. Yeah. No, yeah. not perhaps, like, factually. So those are not minor things. Those are definitive things. Minor. So, like, why would you not tell your kids about that? The, you know, at some point, they're going to drop trow and look down and say, wait, we look different. And you're going to be like, no, you don't. You're exactly the same. And that's, that's lying, isn't that's it? That's when the child, they say, is around four years old. So around zero to four, we're not going to say to a little... Um, 
female uh, a girl that uh, you're a little princess or boy you're such a tiger the labels are gone you're not going to um, put that out outside influence on a child you're just going to be neutral everything's going to be okay. neutral the, the outside influence equal. of biological reality not so would reality, you do this with anything perception. else would you could no but but could we decide that we're not going to acknowledge temperature or weather or traffic and you could just say you know what i don't think it's raining outside or you can decide whether it's raining outside i mean the weatherman says it is that there's snow on the ground or the weather you, you know what i mean the weatherman says that it's 15 degrees no. out but i'm gonna you know what i mean just kind of make up my own reality the parents who are really no, leading this we acknowledge movement. biology and nature as real right but the biology, the parents who came out with this, who came out in the New York Times and started this baby awareness, um, this gender neutral awareness for babies, basically said, why should people be so obsessed if your baby is going to be a boy or a girl? Who cares about that area? It's actually a little human. Mm -hmm. We are bringing a little human into the world. Okay, that's, that's all I can take. And... Here's the, again, the good news is, is that I want people like that talking. Yesterday, people were going, gosh, how do we get rid of the, the view? What do we do to shut down those, uh, those viewpoints? No, we want her to talk. We want that kind of message out there. So regular people, folks in flyover country, people that don't pay attention to the, to politics, you know, their grandpa was a Democrat, uh, they're part of the union, whatever. They're going to go, wait a second. This is friggin' nuts. I, 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 I can't support that. And that's what we're hoping for here on the Rusty Humphreys Rebellion. The other thing we're hoping for is that you will protect yourself. And when I say protect yourself, I'm talking about virtual shield. It's the easiest to use and fastest VPN in the world. And it will protect you and your family from your browsing history being sold. Now, your internet service provider keeps track of your browsing history. I don't know if you knew that. I don't know if you like that. If you'd rather them not know some of the places that you've gone, you'd rather them not sell that, Virtual Shield can help protect you. They've got a lot of services. They're not very expensive. And as a matter of fact, if you use my name, Rusty, as your keyword in checkout, you'll save 20%. So go to virtualshield.com slash rusty and find out what virtual shield and a virtual private network can do for you. Also, if you've been to my website lately, rustylive.com, I'd appreciate it if you'd go there. Cody says, I love flyover country, born and raised Kansan. I lived in Missouri for a long time. I love Texas. I love a lot of places. What else? Oh, I want to thank the nice folks at Liberty One TV. If you haven't gone there yet and check them out online, you really should. Good people. Good shows. You could subscribe to them and, and uh, get additional content. I'm going to start doing some extra stuff for Liberty One only and exclusively. But you got to go subscribe. Have you been on my Facebook page? Rusty Humphreys, look for me in a blue shirt. There's two of them. I got just the personal one. Not as much going on there. But the business one, the one for the show, I'd really appreciate you going there and liking it. Make sure it comes up first because Facebook and the algorithms are just hosing everybody. Let's see. Lexton says, does that mean transsexuals and cross-dressers will disappear? I mean, if babies can pick their gender, then they won't be trapped in a gender they don't want to be. Maybe, Lexton. I don't know. Right-wing news, thank you very much. Liberty One TV, thank you. Most importantly, thank you. Don't forget, the Rusty Emery's podcast is on iTunes and Stitcher and iHeartRadio. And if you'd go there and leave a nice comment, man, that would make a difference. So would going to virtualshield.com slash rusty. Get Virtual Shield. Make sure you use the promo code Rusty in checkout. That's it for me. My name is Rusty Humphreys. We'll see you tomorrow night. Right here, 9 p.m. in the east, 6 p.m. in the west. Right here on Liberty One TV, Right Wing News, and every other place you find me. See you later. Take care.